Okay. It's seven o'clock. Let's get going. Um, so tonight I'm going to chat about bad faith or the, this concept of bad faith um, that Sartre develops in Being and Nothing. And it's probably one of his most famous concepts, I think. Um, existentialism, kind of something that might be kind of named in various different ways. But when we talk about Sartre and existentialism, it, no, no doubt quickly followed by some sort of reference to bad faith. Bad Faith is chapter two part of part one of Being a Nothingness. Um, and worth, I think, us thinking about what its role is in Being a Nothingness. Because we've been talking so far in the few weeks before when we talked about Sartre, um, we've been talking about his work in Transcendence of the Ego and the Emotions. And this is work before Being a Nothingness. And there's an important kind of sort of slight shift in, in the way in which things are presented. So this is this is Sartre himself. This is the start of chapter one, part two. So this is immediately following the bad faith section. And this is Sartre describing himself what's been going on so far in the book. And so he says negation has referred us to freedom, freedom to bad faith, and bad faith to the being of consciousness, which is the requisite condition for the possibility of bad faith. Now that phrase there, the condition for the possibility of bad faith, this is what's called a transcendental argument. So in order for there to be such a thing as bad faith, there must be this other thing organised or uh, this other aspect must be there. Something else must be the case for bad faith to exist. And in this situation, it's the way in which consciousness is, the way in which consciousness exists, or what Sartre refers to as the being of consciousness. So the being and nothingness begins with the problem of negation moves to this question of freedom, from freedom then to the question of bad faith, and then it sort of reveals, as Sartre thinks, um, this relationship that consciousness has to itself. Now what's kind of interesting for those of us who've been reading through Transcendence of the Ego and the Emotions previously, is this is a little bit of kind of a reverse course. Um, there you begin very sort of immediately from the being of consciousness. And so rather than beginning directly from the being of consciousness, in being a nothingness, we find this being of consciousness not arriving until part two, until this part two being for itself. So we've kind of gone through a slightly circuitous route, whereas in Transcendence, the ego and the emotions, a much more direct route straight into the questions about the being of consciousness. And so it's kind of important to kind of think a little bit about why that circuitous route. Um, one way is to, is to sort of consider a little bit what happens at the start of being and nothingness. So it begins with this introductory chapter called The Pursuit of Being, in which we get a kind of condensed, quick account of consciousness and being um, rapidly moving through a series of philosoph philosophical moves. Um, but we get an account which depends on that reflective, pre-reflective distinction that he develops in Transcendence of the Ego and the Emotions. In some ways, what we can see is that being a nothingness, in a sense, begins from where they finish. It also, being a nothingness also, and this is very clear in, in the introductory chapter in Pursuit of Being, being a nothingness also engages much more heavily with Heidegger rather than Husserl, which is what we find to be the, the person, his, his main interlocutor, as it is, in Transcendence of the Ego and the Emotions. It, it's Husserl that he's talking about. It's Husserl that he thinks has made a mistake with the transcendental ego. It's Husserl who... He deploys the argument for the transcendental field um, in which we have the pre-personal subjectivity, the pre-personal individual. It, it's Husserl that's the person Sartre is arguing against. Not exactly Heidegger who he's arguing against in being a nothingness, but it's much closer to that kind of end of the spectrum, if you like. Um, and what the introduction does generally is to stage the problem, to set the scene um, that being a nothingness addresses, and in particular, um, the scene here is characterised by the central role of negation and the problem of nothingness, unsurprisingly given the title of the book. Um, a bit like, you know, that's what it does on the can. It's about being a nothingness, but why is it about nothingness? So Heidegger famously begins being in time by focusing on a specific type of being, uh, one which, as it were, we are, um, we might describe it as a human being, although that lends us with problems because we already kind of presuppose a lot about what we think of as the human there, um, which Heidegger names it Dasein. 
And this particular being is a being able to question its own being, to um, have a stance towards itself that doesn't uh, doesn't sort of um, mm, it isn't just passive. It has this kind of active relationship to itself, being able to question its own being. But for Sartre, this way of being, being able to question, depends on negation, depends on the existence of negation. And Sartre poses his um, his interest in negation here as, in some sense, um, continuing on from where Heidegger got to and actually filling out, in a sense, something that Heidegger kind of missed. Um, and in particular, there's, 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 well, we'll get to this later, in particular, I think there's a strategic reason why, why, why he wants to do that. And so Sartre poses himself, in some sense, is putting forward negation as a kind of absolutely f fundamental element of metaphysics or, or the understanding of the being subjectivity um, in order to kind of complete the Heideggerian move. He actually says it would be necessary to complete the definition. This is, this is the phrase that's up on the screen at the moment. Um, here he says, Heidegger reserves, uh, certainly we, we could apply to consciousness the definition which Heidegger reserves for Dasein say that it is a being such that in its being, its being is in question, but it would be necessary to complete the definition, formulate it more like this. So this is, Heide this is Sartre's move to kind of extend on the work of Heidegger in being and time. So this is, is again, this is, we're trying to just get a sense of the strategic background and, and why, why, why Sartre is staging his, his work in this particular way. As I say, part of it is to move on from Husserl to Heidegger, and part of it is to extend um, beyond Heidegger, just as a way, just as in a way he did try and do for, for Husserl. And so his extension is this: consciousness is a being such that in its being, its being is in question, in so far as this being implies a being other than itself. And here, I think I'll just pause for a moment. So, fir so first of all, some of the students that are reading the text with me um, have commented on on. The kind of curious sense of, um, I think, something like uh, fusion, circularity, bizarreness that's involved in this chapter, and and all the way through being a nothingness, we see it, it, it gets better actually towards the end. But all the way through being a nothingness, we see this very very paradoxical formulations and this very very self referential formulation, such that we have kind of very densely packed sets of concepts self-referring to each other in a way in order to try and define things. And consciousness is a being such that in its being, its being is in question insofar as this being implies a being other than itself. Well, that's, it's just like you, you're lost by the end of the phrase. You're lost by the end of this. It takes ages to try and begin to work this out. Here, I think, um, the completing clause, as it were, the bit that he's trying to add on to Heidegger, the bit that is um, the bit that he's trying to, as it were, you know, contribute to to the discussion is this other than itself. It's a being other than itself, um, and this other than itself is subjectivity for, for Sartre, um, and it's a structure that we might call a structure of self differentiation, and it's this that he's trying to unpack. Um, in particular, in part two of being a nothingness, but it's this what he, that he thinks is revealed or clearly revealed when we look at bad faith, this way in which consciousness subjectivity is other than itself. Um, and so when we look at bad faith, that's, that's kind of the, the background in which it's strategically being deployed, um, is to try and show a particular structure of consciousness, that consciousness is other than itself, being or you know, subjectivity is other than itself. Um, and that this structure is, is a prerequisite for the fact of bad faith. And so bad faith is a kind of, uh, it's, not, it's not a fact, it's not, it's not quite, 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 not quite call it a fact, but it's a, it's a, a facticity, it's a, a feature of the world that depends upon a certain sort of structure of consciousness. Um, now we've already seen another structure of consciousness in the work on transcendence of the ego and the emotions. And so what we've got now, for those of us who've been reading through this, are two different kinds of, hi everyone, hi Job, two different structures of consciousness. We've got the pre-reflective 
reflective structure that we find in transcendence of the ego and that we find deployed in the emotions. Um, so we've got this kind of slightly doubled structure, and we've got a structure there where um, where knowledge itself is 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 on the reflective side, and so it's not really knowledge that we're talking about on the pre-reflective side. So we've got this kind of structure of consciousness that, on the one hand, lives its being, and on the other hand, can reflect on that being. Um, and in that mode of reflection, in that consciousness of mode, um, of where it's consciousness of consciousness. Um, we have this kind of reflexivity, this self-referentiality. So that's one of the structures of consciousness that we've been looking at. And this other structure that is kind of crucial, it's, it's, it's almost like another facet or another way of perceiving the same structure. Um, but this other sort of structure is, is the structure we can call the self-differentiating structure. And this is what we encounter in another really paradoxical phrase. And I'm going to use the word paradox here because I want to connect it to the work we did on Abraham at the start of the course. But it, it's the self-differentiating structures can be revealed in this is in this other paradoxical phrase that we find all the way through various different points that um, consciousness and subjectivity it is what it is not and it is not what it is it is what it is not and it is not what it is I am what I am not and I am not what I am um, this kind of sort of weird you know you you immediately kind of think again confusion slightly strange self-referential slightly kind of curious way in which the concepts kind of refer to each other undermine each other um and in a sense what we're, what we're faced with is is uh, a, a paradoxical situation this self-differentiation occurs in a paradoxical situation because consciousness is not self-identical the kind of uh the, the, a real a, this can get us into in sort of like quite deep kind of metaphysical logical problems, but this is kind of the, one of the cruxes of what Sartre is, thinks about consciousness. Is it's a very specific kind of part of the world. It's a very specific part of the of metaphysics, and, and his metaphysics has stuff that is identical to itself, being in itself, and stuff that isn't identical to itself, being for itself. Um, and that that not being identical to itself. This is what produces this kind of paradox every time we try and identify exactly what we are. We enter into this kind of paradoxical moment. But it's exactly this kind of um, self-differentiating moment which appears paradoxical when we attempt to identify what we are, um, but it's exactly this self-differentiating moment that is the source of, of the creative free um, element, the spontaneous element of consciousness. Now, as we talked a little bit about when we were talking about the pre-reflective reflective, reflective um, structure, this creative, free, spontaneous element of consciousness, the pre-reflective, um, is, is often caught and distorted in the reflective mode. Um, and so we have this kind of situation. Um, yeah, we can make questions maybe later. In fact, I'll have a break in about 10 minutes, and so you can ask any questions there, and I'll look at them and, and come back. Um, so yeah, this, this reflective mode is, is kind of often uh, a way of catching out what we were doing in the pre-reflective, not being able to adequately reflect it, not in a sense. It, there's a distortion that occurs. Um, and that distortion is distortion that arises because of paradoxes that occur, as it were, at the reflective level, but without which consciousness wouldn't exist. It's, yeah, this is the kind of the, the odd bits that we'll have to kind of work through now. Okay, so we've got these two structures, the pre-reflective, reflective, and the self-differentiating. So we can think of um, we can think of consciousness as Sartre poses it as having these two kind of ways of, of you know, two structures that we can kind of overlay onto things. And so, bad faith is going to play a particular kind of role in, particularly in being a nothingness, um, for Sartre in attempting to sort of. Uh, I'm not going to say give evidence for, because he, he's, he's not going to want to give evidence for, give an account of. Um, it's going to play a role in Sartre giving an account of consciousness that sustains this claim that consciousness is not self-identical, that consciousness is, is self-differentiating. And it's going to do this um, by making a distinction between lying and bad faith. So I think it's, a, it's worth our while kind of looking next at exactly what that distinction um, is.
it's also going to be kind of crucial in a sense to to recognize and to remember this 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 role of negation um they will have to come back to that it's kind of, <laughs> we'll have to come back to it i think the most important thing to to kind of notice um in terms of the importance of the role of negation is that is that this self differentiation this structure of self differentiation is is essentially um originates as a knot um and this is what he begins the chapter on bad faith um with this kind of um consciousness arises as a knot um but that arising as a knot that's kind of as it were the first moment of self differentiation so negation and self differentiation um are kind of as it were you know the result of the of, of the motor so self differentiation is what results as it were um from this capacity to negate um, and so this is why negation and nothingness is so crucial art well bad faith is, is he says at one point negation directed inward and it's this direction inward that is going to be important and going to sort of um, enable us to see why it might point to something like structures of consciousness and so we have to sort of first of all separate out what bad faith is from lying because um, bad faith crudely speaking is lying to yourself but there's a difference between lying to others and lying to yourself and so what exactly is that sort of difference uh, so first of all um, to lie is uh, Sartre thinks a behavior of transcendence going beyond myself going out of myself it's not a it doesn't keep me within myself it doesn't sort of keep me as I am it's a behavior that, that you know points as it were out to the world or to what we might call the mid sign the being with others um, so obviously I can't lie unless I'm in a situation in which there are going to be you know entities to lie to um, and it also double it also produces a kind of double structure the conditions of reality of the lie are that i have my existence for myself um and i also have my existence for the other um and so there's this kind of doubled relationship in which i can have a sense of what i am but i can also have a sense of what other people think i am and this relationship of the existence of the other and the existence for the other this doubled relationship enables this process of dissimulation it enables this process of lying now those kind of elements that we've analyzed now is as conditions of of, of reality a lie um and which sartre kind of begins the the, the the chapter on on bad faith with those kind of elements make no sense when we talk about lying to yourself um or at least they make a lot less sense let's say they're, they're, it's not obvious how it can work and so what what, what Sartre does is then take us through um, we might say is the most prominent explanation of how you can lie to yourself which is psychoanalysis and it takes us through kind of problematics in that and then begins to move into this point of a positive exposition or a positive account of bad faith um, towards the end of that chapter he says at one point what changes everything is the fact that in bad faith in bad faith it is from myself that i am hiding the truth thus the duality of the deceiver and deceived does not exist here so that duality of of you know the being with others the lying that it, you know it takes place in a situation of being with others obviously it's fairly easy for us most of the time to identify yes there's a deceiver and there's a deceived so that's the duality he's talking about but it, the duality of the deceiver and the deceived does not exist in bad faith, he says. Bad faith, on the contrary, implies, in essence, the unity of a single consciousness. Um, <laughs> the unity of a single consciousness. Note that if we were to say the unity of a plural consciousness, we wouldn't really have a problem. Um, if we had the unity of, like, many selves in one, or, you know, many elements to myself, or any of these kind of things, then we wouldn't really have a problem, because it would be one element of myself that would be the deceiver, and the other element of myself would be the deceived. This, this presents, <laughs> this goes against Sartre's kind of fundamental um, intuition that consciousness is uh, always conscious, always capable of being consciousness of itself. It's always consciousness of an object or of something, um, but it's also always capable of being consciousness of itself, consciousness of consciousness. It's always capable of what he calls translucency, 
Um, and so there's no, for Sartre, there's no kind of hidden elements inside consciousness that are actually controlling it. Um, what that would do would remove our freedom and turn us into a kind of passive, um, a passive object. It would be something that in, in the world of the in itself rather than the for itself, the terms he uses in being a nothingness. And so this, this idea of the, 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 of the lying now, now becomes even more complicated in a way. Because not only do we not have an external deceived to my deceiver, there's not someone I've lied to as well as me lying, not only are there not like two people, there's not two people metaphorically, as it were, even, so even you know, there's not like two elements of myself that can be kind of brought up here. Um, and it's unsurprising perhaps that uh, psychoanalysis is a target um, because obviously the response um, constantly is going to fairly easily be deployed against Sartre is, well, you know, lying to yourself or bad faith is a result of, of psychological drives that are being repressed, libidinal, libidinal urges that the ego is kind of controlling, um, and a whole sort of structure of psychoanalytic explanation becomes um, like overlaid onto consciousness. To explain how we, we can you know, do things we don't want to do, or how we can lie to ourselves about certain things, or how we can be, as Sartre puts it, in bad faith. Um, but for but for Sartre, psychoanalysis and the recourse to the unconscious is a false answer. Okay, it, it, it's it's a kind of answer that that actually smuggles back in uh, the very thing it's trying to explain. And the crux of that problem comes is what he calls the sensor. So. For Sartre, psychoanalysis always, and he, he, he constantly comes back to this kind of argument, psychoanalysis always kind of presupposes a knowing sensor at the heart of the process, um, and in particular at the heart of the process in, in such a way that it kind of has to know and hide from my consciousness what's going on. Um, the sensor at the root of repression in the psychoanalytic explanation is posited as an effect of the unconscious drive, and it's presented as ignorant, but it for Sartre must know what it's doing and this produces he thinks just a paradoxical situation in which the very thing um, that, that psychoanalysis is trying to ex ex you know, explain how we don't know what we're doing um, just posits something that does know what it's doing at the heart of it. Now for Sartre he, he asks a question how can we conceive of a knowledge ignorant of itself to know is to know that one knows all knowing is consciousness of knowing and this this translucency of knowing, this knowing that you know, um, is explored in various different ways inside philosophy and inside the analytical tradition is explored sort of a, a lot more differently than it is inside existentialism, but is, is not a universally shared kind of concept about the relationship of knowledge to itself. But what we can do is we can kind of separate two ways of, of us, um, as it were, taking knowledge, one of which is translucent, one of which is that if you know, then you know that you know, and the other of which is, is opaque, which is that actually sometimes and quite often you don't really know what you know. And the psychoanalytic mode goes down that route. But for Sartre, so does any, any mode that tries to give you, as it were, an explanation or a causal re reason for your behaviour. And so that would also include most psychology, it would also include most naturalistic science, it would also include a whole series of things that kind of essentially describe your consciousness as an illusion. And I think this comes now to, to the strategic reason why Sartre is, is pursuing his particular line of thought, is what he thinks can't be the case is that consciousness can't simply be an illusory structure. Um, it's a real structure. Um, and that's kind of his, his absolute claim. And he, and he, and he derives this from, from Descartes. Um, he takes the Cartesian moment of the cogito to try and, as it were, um, be a crucial, again, not quite fact, it's not quite the right way of putting it, but think of it a little bit like a, a crucial element of the world that can't be denied. It's a certainty. Um, and so in that situation, he has this kind of problem of explanations which make uh, consciousness and knowledge opaque to itself. Um, have a difficulty in, in encountering and dealing with this kind of element of consciousness that's, that's, not, that's translucent, that knows itself, and that is encountered primarily as a kind of, um, again, not evidence, but as a kind of element of the world, encountered prim primarily in terms of the cogito. 
And it's it's interesting in some sense to think about the role that Descartes has all the way through being a nothingness, and particularly towards the end, Sartre is very keen not to construct a dualism. He's not interested in producing something like you know a mind-body dualism. He's not interested in in a sense, in a sense, in 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 uh, drawing on Cartesianism as a dualism of mind and body. But what he is interested in doing is drawing on Cartesian cogito moment um, as uh, a moment of defense of consciousness. And I think this is, in a sense, Sartre's project all the way through. His strategic project is to try and defend consciousness and its freedom from any kind of relationship which makes it opaque, unable to know itself, and somehow um, the result of prior non-conscious causes, such that, in the end, consciousness becomes a kind of illusion. And so Sartre's project, in a sense, is how to enable us to think the reality of consciousness. And bad faith is this, this process of lying to oneself. Bad faith is, is, is a kind of crisis point for any of those explanations. It's a kind of crisis point which enables explanations like psychoanalysis to seem competent and, and serious explanations, and yet at the same time produces this kind of moment of crisis or choice um, such that you know, if we go down that route, we also have to, as it were, give up the reality of consciousness. So Sartre wants to kind of engage with this crisis produced in the moment of lying to yourself and somehow be able to maintain the reality of consciousness, not as an illusion, um, but as actual freedom um, and core element of, uh, of the world that we are and the being that we are. Okay, it's 25 past. I'm going to take about a five-minute break. So we're back about half past 31. Um, if people do have any questions, feel free to put them into chat now. For Free University Brighton people, obviously we have our seminar at 8 on Zoom. Um, and if you're not at the Free University of Brighton, then you're welcome to check out my Twitch page. There's various ways to get in touch with me after lectures. Um, anyway, five minute break. See you at about 7.32.
okay, <laughs> someone pointed out to me, there's a bit of lag in the timing, so when I say particular time, voice doesn't actually stop watching the stream or whatever at the same time, so bear that in mind. Um, I think that was about five minutes-ish, but I assume you did the same as I did, which is maybe you had a stretch, had a, had a move, got yourself a drink, went for a wee, whatever. Anyway, let's see if we can get back to... Um, Back to this kind of problem of bad faith. So as I say, bad faith is strategically this kind of crisis point, um, as it were, between like a decision that can be made about the nature of consciousness, um, its reality or its illusory status, um, or its its reality and its its sort of concrete status. Um, and psychoanalysis takes one route down here, which Sartre thinks is going to deny consciousness, going to turn it into kind of something like an illusion. Or a mistake or a guise or a disguise and he wants to go down a different route which reaffirms or affirms he thinks would re he thinks reaffirms because he thinks co the cogito first of all is the first affirmation of this but reaffirms kind of reality freedom consciousness um and this is this this divide or this choice is to do with this relationship between you know do we have an opaque reason that we can't understand and that maybe theory can show us or do we have a translucent consciousness which we kind of can understand, we can see what we're doing, but somehow, for some reason, and in some way, we, we kind of don't. We avoid it. Um, and I think that, that I mean, that's Sartre's, that's Sartre's take, that we're, in a, sense, in a sense, trying to escape our freedom, our consciousness. Um, sketch, the sketch for theory of the emotion is Sartre, both of those. Um, sometimes the sketch for theory of the emotions is just called the emotions. And, and so bad faith presents this crisis because it kind of, um, did it dis, did, you know, distinct from lying, it's not obvious where the duality, where, where you can have the deceiver and the deceived kind of relationship here. Um, but he thinks that bad faith, like irony, he, he, at the start, of the, before he goes on to bad faith, he does briefly mention irony and a couple of other kind of um, modes that we might think of as duplicitous or doubled. Um, but he picks on bad faith and what he calls patterns of bad faith um, as his example. Um, and it has to be said that the way in which there, there are three, four examples at least um, that occur during the chapter, and none of them are particularly lovely to read through. So there's a whole sort of, you know, the, 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 the exa there's two of the examples involve women. One involves someone who's gay and, and the other involves a waiter. And the two that involve women and the one that involves the person who's gay you know both of them are presented in quite negative ways actually <laughs> they're not things you know they kind of have hints of of like you know a misogyny and, and homophobia inside them um which i probably i mean then i you know they're ambiguous at the, at the very least but so it's difficult to use though i don't want to necessarily use them heavily because i think that they're they're very very situated descriptions um but the idea of bad faith that I think is presented in those examples is uh, this complicated idea of self-deceit. Complicated idea of self-deceit. And it's the complications that kind of matter here. Um, it's how are they able to be, how are they able to sort of operate in this kind of complicated way? How is it that the person who is, um, you know, flirting is, is, is able to sort of, you know, deceive themselves that that's not what they're really doing uh, how is it that the person who has a particular sexual preference is able to deceive themselves that that's not really what's going on um, now the two yeah the coquette that's one of the examples and they'll say i'm not I'm not greatly happy with any of the examples in the bad faith chapter they seem a little bit problematic however i mean as i say they point to something that i think i think is is we could accept is probably a reasonable kind of account of the way in which human beings behave and so just because his examples are problematic doesn't necessarily mean that that the patterns he's talking about aren't aren't there um i just think that his descriptions are very situated in his own particular time um and in that situation it kind of you know we have to kind of read through a little bit what what's going on but in the love example, one of the things that we can maybe think about there is, is he, he, he talks sometimes in terms of this way in which 
the doubled nature of our understanding of ourselves as a human being is part of the difficulty. And so this can, this can come about, we can probably relatively easily by thinking about this relationship to, to love and lust, let's say, to sex and love, um, in which, you know, we can kind of, we can encounter, as it were, the, what we might call the sensual or, or the, the aesthetic or the, or the physical side of, of, of sexual and loving relationships. And we can also encounter what we think of as something like the spiritual or the, you know, the more than side. Um, and these kind of elements of what it is that we, we sort of take to be part of human being, not by human being, I mean the way in which the human is, not, not, I'm not naming a species there, um, but these kind of parts of, of, of experiences that we can see kind of, kind of almost being in tension with each other doesn't seem to be particularly controversial for us to acknowledge, and we can probably find interesting examples um, uh, in various different ways um, and they often come down to uh, to as it were an example in which uh, an experience can be um, articulated without the concept of meaning and with the concept of meaning and so we can articulate the concept of sexual love without the concept of meaningfulness as a kind of physicality sensuality stimulus response mechanisms and a whole series of like psychological and neurological issues um, we can articulate it in a kind of physical way without without the concept of meaning, and we can also articulate it with the concept of meaning, and so that it, that it has sort of there could be meaningful encounter. And it's this that I think is kind of a one way of thinking about the two elements um, that are kind of crucial to what it is to be a human, or what it is to be the kind of being that we are. Um, and these two elements start to names as facticity and transcendence. And again, I've put this up on screen. So he's talking here about the coquette, and he's talking about how she has a hand, put a hand in, in, in you know, she flirts, putting a hand, um, or letting a hand, sorry, be taken while she's walking down the street, without kind of, without doing it actively. So allowing herself to be kind of taken, her hand to be taken, allowing that kind of sensuality to be there, but not affirming the meaning of what's going on. Um, and... He says, what, what such says is, what unity do we find in these various aspects of bad faith that in these aspects, for example, are that she sees herself as not being her body whilst her hand is there as well as being her body, they, they, this double relationship. What unity, such says, do we find in these various aspects of bad faith? It is a certain art of forming contradictory concepts which unite in themselves both an idea and the negation of that idea. And so I am kind of, this, this is the meaning and it's not the meaning. This is the, the experience and it's not the experience. This is a physically enjoyable experience, but, you know, it, it's, it's also a meaningful experience. And so it's not just a physically enjoyable experience. It's a meaningful, those kind of, it is and it isn't moments. Contradictory, uh, uni united, unity rather, of, of an idea and its negation. And here he goes. The basic concept, which is thus engendered, utilizes the double property of the human being who is at once a facticity and a transcendent. These two aspects of human reality are and ought to be capable of a valid coordination. I'll come back to that sentence. But bad faith does not wish either to coordinate them nor to surmount them in a synthesis. Bad faith seeks to affirm their identity while preserving their differences. It must affirm facticity as being transcendence and transcendence as being facticity in such a way so that the instant when a person apprehends the one, he can find himself abruptly faced with the other. The last bit will kind of, that's what we'll explore a little bit here, but that sentence in the middle there, these two aspects, facticity and transcendence, these two aspects of human reality are and ought to be capable of valid coordination. Very strange way of putting it. How can you both be an animal and be a spiritual being at the same time? How can you, as it were, you know, um, both be body and mind at the same time? How can you um, both be what you've been made and make of what you are something else? Um, those are the two elements, if you remember, that he talks about in terms of freedom. It's, it's this small freedom for such as this small moment in which you can make something of what you've been made. Um, and the, what you've been made is the facticity element, if you like. So you've been made into a particular person in a particular century, in a particular culture, in a particular ethnicity, in a particular space. In a particular, you know, you've been made into a particular kind of element of our social space. And yet at the same time for Sartre, you cannot all, at all points make yourself 
make something of what you've been made. And his example, if you remember, we talked about before, was Gene, who is made a thief. Made a thief. <laughs> made a thief. That's a terrible way of putting it. He's, been, he's made into a thief, but makes of that a poet. Makes himself out of that a poet. And this, for Sartre, is what he means by freedom. And that capacity to make yourself and not be what you've been made into, to make your something of that, that's the transcendence. That's a transcendent moment. So bad faith, here is an invalid coordination between these two elements. An invalid coordination. And Sartre thinks that there is capable, there is a valid coordination that's capable. So... Let's just refer back a little bit for those who have been on the course for a while to, to, the, to the Night of Faith and the Night of Resignation. So these are the two characters we find in Fear and Trembling. Um, now Abraham is this Knight of Faith. He's the one, like all Knights of Faith, able to take the leap. And in order to do that, we have to re remember that um, this is a, le a leap into the impossible. Okay, this is, this is, uh, this is to go to the point to encounter and be and to live faith in such a way that it goes against all possible knowledge structures because any way of describing what's going on is paradoxical. So it's both a murder and a sacrifice that Abraham is carrying out. And the knight of faith is the one who can make the leap into that position, um, move out of uh, the structures of the ethical, the social, that which we can explain to each other, that which we can kind of, as it were, you know, give an account of to each other into this this realm um uh this realm of freedom in a sense um but the realm that that is that arises from what what, what Kierkegaard calls the teleological suspension of the ethical so this this leap this kind of breaking out as it were of facticity of the social of what i am for others um this leap is made by the knight of faith Abraham is the example of this, and it kind of is able to bring together in a valid coordination um, paradoxical moments. Um, so for Abraham, the paradoxical moment is that he is going to kill his son, and at the same time he's going to get the promise from God that his son is going to be the father of the nation. And so he's going to, both going to kill his son and somehow not kill his son, so it's a paradox. For knowledge, it's a paradox and an impossible situation, whereas for, for Abraham... It's a kind of mark of his capacity to go beyond knowledge, beyond the social, beyond the facticity um, that is revealed in his capacity to act. And, it's a, and so that's a kind of makes him what he is. That, that act makes him what he is. It produces this kind of valid coordination um, between his facticity, what he's been made and what he can make of that. Whereas the Knight of Resignation, on the other hand, this is again, you remember, a character in Fear and Trembling. The Knight of Resignation is able to recognize that movement of faith in Abraham, but not able to do it, um, not able to live it. Uh, and so, in a sense, kind of constructs a whole series of arguments or, or explanations as to why they're not able to do that. And so that Knight of Resignation, one of the questions we might want to think about is how close that Knight of Resignation is to bad faith. Um, because in, in Fear and Trembling, that's, that's not immediately how you would perhaps think of the Night of Resignation. It wouldn't immediately make you think someone in bad faith. But the fact that he can't make that leap is very close to this idea that I think Sartre is putting forward here, that he can't make a valid coordination between his capacity to produce at any point freely a meaning for his act and go beyond what he's doing and what's been made of him, and the fact that he's been made into something, he's been placed in a particular situation. Sartre says that, that and this is to move, I think, to, to the kind of problematic element of belief and bad faith, this kind of very confusing discussion that, that occurs towards the end of the chapter. Sartre says that the original project of bad faith is a decision in bad faith on the nature of faith. And so uh, when we see that, it should hopefully sort of, you know, draw the connection between the questions in fear and trembling quite strongly. Um, but it's this, it's this relationship to faith that kind of underpins Sartre's discussion of belief. And this is 
possibly one of the most peculiar kind of discussions that we can we can encounter there's a, a sentence where he goes to believe is to know that one believes remember that translucency of consciousness so we can be conscious of our consciousness we can be aware of it we can sort of reflect on it we can take account of it it's not hidden from us um so to believe is to know that one believes and to know that one believes is no longer to believe and it's this last moment that's that's the strange one it's this last moment that is kind of explicable in some ways by thinking about the night of resignation it's in some ways ex explicable by thinking about the situation remember the situation that Sartre is writing this in uh, you know the Nazi occupation in, in Paris the kind of way in which collaboration and resistance are, are faced you know every day as direct questions the way in which you see that around you um, and the way in which that kind of puts everybody in this really complex situation between facticity and transcendence because their facticity you know being placed in certain situations which seem to have no freedom in them is for Sartre just simply you know a, a particularly unfortunate facticity it there is no situation in which you aren't free um, there is no situation in which the transcendent moment the, the, the responsibility you can take for what's been made of you doesn't exist and so in those situations in which you know, th those kind of very, very crucial crisis situations like Abraham or like, you know, the occupation of Paris by the Nazis or, or you know, it, or, or personal situations where it becomes, you know, crucial, as it were, um, to know what it is you're going to do, to know how you're going to sort of act in the world. Um, the idea that, that, that belief is actually kind of self-destructive um, is really, really peculiar. To, to, to know that one believes is to no longer believe. Now that's kind of, there's an element here that's very, very important. So if we were to go back to the pre-reflective reflective, and so if we're living, if we're in the, in the pre-reflective moment, if we're, you know, as it were, uh, our consciousness of the world is, is, a, is a consciousness, you know, that's a joyful consciousness of the world in which we are encountering the world joyfully, um, at the point at which I kind of recognize that, reflect upon that, there's this idea that that, that, that flow of joyfulness is, is interrupted and no longer there exists. And there's something similar here. So the believing activity, that the way in which we are when we believe, um, is susceptible to being disrupted the minute we begin to kind of reflect upon what we're doing. And I think this is again crucial for this relationship to faith so if we if we distinguish between something like awareness um, and something like knowledge we say awareness is that which we have of the world and of ourselves so we're aware of of being happy being joyful being sad Awareness is that which we have of ourselves before we've actually asked ourselves how I feel. Um, then knowledge is what we get, as it were, when we ask ourselves how do I feel. So there's these two kind of moments. And at the moment you ask yourself that, at the moment at which you reflect, you disrupt the flow. You disrupt that awareness. You disrupt the being of that awareness. You disrupt it just enough, just enough. To, to introduce something that's not that awareness, to introduce this negativity, this split, this divide, this kind of odd doubling. And an odd doubling that is kind of an inversion at the same time. So you go from a kind of unmediated flow, presence in the world, to this separation out. And so this is, I think, what he means when he says, to know that one believes is to no longer believe is no longer to actually be in that state, in that particular mode of awareness. But that first line, to believe is to know that one believes, and to know that one believes is no longer to believe. That first line, to believe is to know that one believes. There's an ambiguity there. Because again, as I say, this, this, if, we, if we take knowledge here to be something like pre-reflective awareness, then he's going to say, yes, there's a kind of pre-reflective awareness that you, you're, you're in a belief situation. So the person who believes in God, for example, um, in their everyday life, as, uh, you know, just goes around and, and he's, he's happily getting on with that. Before they're in a process of, of reflecting on it, before, if you like, they question that, 
um, we can say that there's, a, there's something that is lost as soon as they begin to question. And yet, this is kind of this is kind of like the next point that's kind of crucial. There's no way not to have both of those moments for Sartre. That's that's kind of the crucial element. It's not that you can stay in the pre-reflective moment and you can stay in the flow and you can stay in that. To do that is to deny your transcendence, to deny the fact that you can say at any point, well, maybe I don't believe, maybe it's wrong, you, to deny that, it, that at any point you can question. Um, and so that's not, an, uh, not a route. And to just destroy the idea of belief completely, that's not a route. And so this is what, what kind of bad faith, as it were, kind of arises out of. So good faith, um, let's say good faith is believing what you believe, being in that particular state. Well, good faith in a sense flees, Sartre, Sartre argues, argues, it flees this capacity to at any point question that belief. And it tries to kind of deny this possibility in a way. Whereas bad faith, on the other hand, takes refuge in the idea that there is no belief that I can actually live coherently. There is no kind of way in which I can do the leap of faith. Now, both of them are refusing, as it were, to take responsibility for this, this, this uh, double property, what he calls the double property of the human being. Both of them are refusing to take responsibility for this continual situation in which, no matter what I've been made into, no matter what the world's made of me, I've always got this capacity to question it and to, in some sense, respond freely to that, to take responsibility for that. I mean, let's think, just to close, in, uh, this, I mean, in this situation, the way in which you know, people like, engage with uh, the, the disease that's around at the moment, the COVID disease, there's constantly this relationship between, in a sense, you know, uh, knowing on the one hand that they're a vector, they are, as a body, a vector of transmission of the disease. And on the other hand, this kind of incapacity to live with this and this capacity to sort of go beyond it and also to disrupt that. Um, and there's this constant tension where people, for Sartre thinks, like, in a sense, can never live with the duality, but must always kind of go in one direction or the other. They must always try and sort of destroy their belief or not have any questions. Um, and it's this kind of problematic of, like, you can't encounter yourself both as the facticity, the fact that you're a vector of disease, for example, and a transcendence, which, let's say, is, is the fact that you can put a bloody mask on. I mean, that, that in a sense, is, a, is an act of transcendence. It's a free act that you can, you can relate to that. And, and when we see people who, like, then refuse to do that, of course, we think, refuse to, let's say, put a mask on. Of course, we thought of maybe have a problem with that, or maybe we don't. Maybe we think it's a, it's a good thing. But, but the difference of behavior there reflects precisely this difference of transcendence, this freedom of how we can respond to the way in which we find ourselves, the different kind of responsibilities um, that are enacted. And responsibility, and taking responsibility for what's been made of you is not necessarily a bad thing. Everyone kind of first encounters this idea of this level of responsibility that Sartre places on us as in some sense um, a negative, constantly placing upon us uh, a burden of accepting uh, a freedom that's simply too much to handle. And in fact, I mean, the difficulty is, is that without the capacity to, to be responsible, there, there's nothing interesting, in a sense, in which w that we can do. So if I'm just simply a biological entity resulting from processes of natural selection, then obviously my achievements or anything I manage to do is just, in a sense, a kind of accident of that biological um, process. If I'm able to, as it were, sustain a particular act or a particular uh, way of a stance towards the world, despite um, and in the face of everything pushing against that, if I'm able to sustain that, if I'm able to sustain, say, uh, learning of a, of, a, of a musical instrument, or let's just say, if I'm able to sustain being good, um, if I'm obviously not responsible for my behavior and it's just a result of a biological process, then I can't take any sort of... Um, can't take any any you know any any gratitude for that. I can't take any any value in that. Uh, so I do need to, in a sense, have the responsibility in order to be able to produce any kind of positive value as well as a negative value. And this this duplicitous notion, this doubled notion of consciousness between the facticity and the transcendence, between the kind of pre-reflective and the reflective, this constant living with ourselves as both 
something that has been made and something that can make something of that. This capacity to, as it were, um, take responsibility for that doubled nature of our reality, this is what uh, Sartre would call the valid coordination uh, between facticity and transcendence. And bad faith, just like good faith, um, are both ways of trying to avoid the fact uh, that there's, um, there's no final answer to what I am. It's not like I'm a good person or a bad person. It's not like I believe or I don't believe. There's no final answer that I can ever give to what I am. Um, and in fact, he actually says at some point, the embarrassing constraint which we constantly experience is our very incapacity to recognize ourselves, to constitute ourselves as being what we are. And, and that kind of um, capacity to live with uncertainty and to live with freedom as a kind of uncertainty is, in, in the end, what Sartre thinks is going to be this valid coordination between facticity and transcendence and bad faith to that extent is a way of trying to, just like good faith, as I say, a way of trying to somehow simplify out the complexity, of the doubled nature of the human being for Sartre, and the way in which that doubled nature arises from a capacity to negate and a capacity in the end to say something like, no, actually, no. Um, to say to the world, to ourselves, to anyone around us, actually, no, we're not having that, no. Um, and that is the starting point, I think, for freedom for Sartre, and a starting point for any situation um, in which we, as it were, able to take responsibility for ourselves, that capacity to basically go, actually, I'm not doing that. Right, sorry if that's um, not answered all your lovely questions about bad faith and, and the duplicitous and doubled nature of consciousness. It's a very confusing, and, and we're never going to be able to cover it in one session. Um, but... Uh, that's kind of um, what we'll be talking about a little bit more in the seminar for Free University Brighton people. That's the end of the existentialism course for now. But as I say, I'm going to continue to be around on Monday evenings talking about my research. Next week, I'm talking with a guy called Eric Harper about research I've been doing um, for a while on Fanon, another kind of existentialist as it happens, um, and uh, the climate uh, crisis. Uh, but I'm going to be around, I think, on Monday evenings just to sort of go and research, uh, report on my research and, and chat with anyone who wants to come along and talk about particular essays or particular bits of, uh, of philosophical. So thank you very much all, and um, I'll catch you at some other point. Thanks a lot. See you fub people in Zoom in a moment. <laughs>